All right, okay, so then it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker this week, uh, who's uh, Anastasios Tsiamis, or Tassos Tsiamis. Uh, he's a PhD student at the ESC department of the University of Pennsylvania, advised by George Papas, and he's interested in uh, questions around machine learning theory and control, online learning, and today he's gonna be telling us about uh, how linear systems can be hard to learn. Over to you, Tassos. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see my screen? Okay, thank you. Absolutely. So thank you very much for the introduction. Also, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm very happy to talk today here about my recent work on learning linear systems. And I'm also extra happy to talk in front of an RL audience. You know, coming from a control theoretic background, I think it's very interesting to uh, listen to, feed, from, to feedback from your perspective. And I would, be interested, I would be interested to see, you know, if there are any connections with, uh, you know, uh, works in RL. Anyway, so as I said, my background is mostly from control theory. So we have studied extensively how to control systems of the following form. For example, systems like plants or mechanical systems like vehicles, like a car or a drone. And in all of those cases, controlling such dynamical systems can be abstracted using a block diagram like the following. So we have a dynamical system that evolves over time. And the evolution of this system is captured by uh, the state of the system. For example, if we have a drone, then this state can be the position of the drone. And then we have a feedback loop here that receives this state information and applies a control input to control the system. And this control input can be, for example, in the case of a drone, the torque or a velocity command. And notice here that I have included the model of the system M that the control input uses. So if we know something about the system, we know a model, we can design uh, a feedback loop in order to control. But in many situations, such a model might not be available. We might not know such a system. Uh, and the reason we might know, not know the system is that, for example, we might not completely know the physics. Or even if we know the physics, we might not know the parameters uh, of the system. So we might not have a model. In this case, of course, we have to use some data in order to learn how to do control in this case. And in order to le do learning in linear systems, uh, sorry, in dynamical systems, there are, have been two main architectures. First, we have the model-based architectures, where based on some data, we first uh, learn a model. So let's say we have a finite number of data n, and we learn a model uh, based on this number of data n. And then in a separate stage, we design the controller in order to control the system using any method we want. And of course, this control design will depend on the model. Uh, there are many examples in control theory using this uh, architecture, like model predictive control, for example. Uh, but we also have another architecture. We have the model-free architecture. This is well studied in, in reinforcement learning. Also in control theory, it has been studied as well. For example, the PID control uh, is of this type, where we directly use the data in order to directly learn a control law. For example, if we parameterize uh, the controls uh, based on a parameter theta, we use the data to directly optimize over this parameter theta. And there's a conceptual difference. In the first case, learning is in a separate stage from the control design, while in the second case, uh, both of them are done at the same time. Of course, it's not my point to argue in favor of one method or the other. Both of them have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, in control theory, we have studied a lot the model-based architecture. And the reason is that we have interpretability. So, for example, if something goes wrong in the system, if we have a model, then it's easy to argue you know, what, what has went wrong. You know, like if we have, for example, a sensor failure or an, an actuator failure. Also, if we have a model estimate, we can also argue about robustness based on this nominal model that we have here and some, let's say, error bound around this model. We could design a, a robust controller, for example. Uh, of course, the model free has advantages as well. For example, if we have a very complex systems and we don't know how to do controller design, then maybe we should prefer a model free method. But for the purposes of this talk, I will focus on the first case, on the model based architecture. And also, for now, let's forget about the control design and the robustness issues. And let's only focus on the learning component. This is also known in the control community as system identification, because we want, based on some data, to learn the model of the system. 
So let's now focus on this uh, learning architecture. And the goal here is to learn a model based on a finite number of data uh, with an adequate accuracy, where here M, without the subscript N, is an ideal model that we want to estimate. For example, if I had an infinite amount of data. And there are many fundamental questions we can ask about this problem. For example, uh, what is the sample complexity of this problem? How many samples do we need in order to have good performance? And which systems have good sample complexity and are easy to learn, or have large sample complexity and are hard to learn? And another interesting question, at least for me, coming from the control of theoretic background, is which system theoretic properties, which properties of the dynamical system affect learnability? Are there some properties that can make learning hard or easy? So, okay, this is a very general problem. Uh, by adding some structure to it, we can maybe get some insights. So for this talk, we consider linear systems and we will be more specific about these boxes here. So let's consider the following dynamical system. Uh, this is called state space equations and it's a linear model. X is the state of the system. In the example of the drone, you can think about, think X, about X as the, the uh, uh, for example, the position of the drone or the velocity of the drone. Then you have the exogenous input U. You can think about this as, for example, the torque of the motor in the drone. And in the case, and then we have the, an additional uh, disturbance or noise, which can perturb the state equation. For example, this can be the wind that changes the position of the drone. Now for this talk, we will assume that the disturbance is IID Gaussian. And also we will assume that the initial state of the system is zero. Uh, by n, uh, we will denote the state dimension, which is like the number of states that we have. By p, we will denote the number of inputs. And by r, we will denote the number of noises. No notice here that we allow h to have a low rank uh, representation. So this r here, for example, can be less than n. For example, we can have actuation noise. And in this case, h can be equal to b. So let's see now what the problem formulation looks like. We have an unknown system that generates data sequentially. So we have a state, uh, a series of state data that are generated by this unknown system. And we also have some input data, which we can generate using any method we like. We can use, let's say, white noise, or we can use an active learning method. It, it, we can use any method. And then the goal is, of course, to learn the unknown um, model. Uh, here we focus on learning of A and B, but potentially we could also try to learn the noise representation. And here we consider single trajectory data in the sense that we have one rollout of the, of the system, but we could also have uh, multiple rollouts. We, we can adapt the results here to multiple rollouts. And the block diagram of this problem is as follows. We have the system which generates the data, then we do some system identification, and we have some estimates of the unknown matrix. Now let's add some assumptions to make the problem more specific and more tractable. As I mentioned, the system is unknown. We don't know anything apart from the state dimension, which we know because we measure the state. Uh, we also have unknown noise dimension. So the low, if the noise has a low rank representation, we don't know the, what this rank is. Now, next, we impose some bounds on the state matrices. This will make the sample complexity tractable. And we use like a, a constant here that bounds the magnitude of the state space parameters. Uh, we assume that the system is uh, non-explosive. By this, we mean that the uh, largest eigenvalue, the spectral radius of the matrix A is less or equal to one. And this excludes unstable systems where this spectral radius can be larger than one. We do this for simplicity. We could also have similar uh, conclusions if we consider unstable systems. Finally, and this is an important assumption we consider here. Regardless what input strategy we use, we assume that we have bounded control energy in the sense that the expected value of the input cannot be larger than a constant M uh, at any time. And this can, for example, represent hard actuation limits. For example, the motor in, in the drone cannot exert more torque than a limit. Or it can represent some limited control budget that we have. Uh, also, I want to stress out that uh, compared to other assumptions 
uh, in other settings. We don't have a generative model in the sense that the data are generated sequentially and we cannot directly sample any transition pair X, U. We can only control what U we select. But then by selecting an, an action or input U, we affect what the next state will be. In this sense, if we want to sample a state action pair, we need to first treat the respective states either by chance, randomly, or by using inputs. And this is exactly one of the challenges, because as we will see later, in order to reach every possible state, we need to have some excitation in our system. We need to have some exploration. So, so I, I have a, I have a yeah. quick question regarding sure. this expectation that you had in the condition regarding you. Yes. So that expectation, I suppose it's like a conditional expectation, condition okay. under history up to T minus so, one. Okay, it's over the randomness of potential randomness of, of, over you and over the potential randomness over the noise. Yeah, so but is it like the, the marginal expectation or, or no, condition now, of the history? Let's not condition right? on anything. No. Let's oh, say okay. it's, you know, an absolute like, uh, expectation with respect to all around us. Okay, but, but then it doesn't rule out. It doesn't rule out, out. It doesn't rule very large controls. Mm -hmm. It doesn't allow. Along certain control. trajectories. Exactly, right? exactly. So, so it can no. happen that you pass through a trajectory where you just deterministically crank out huge controls. Yeah. Right? Sorry? So you're talking past each other a little bit. So Gergo is saying that it could be that like you have a feedback control, I'd say, that grows with the state, the state grows, but that happens exponentially small chance. And so you can have like really large controls with small probability, uh, right? This condition allows that. Yeah, okay, yes, true. This allows this case, of course. We, it doesn't, so we could replace that with hard uh, limits in the sense that we can also have, you know, without the expectation. This is, let's say, the least conservative condition for the lower bounds that I will show later, uh, right? Because if you impose hard constraints without the expectation, it's more strict in some sense, right? So can I because ask a clarification yeah. question for, for yeah. the framework too? Uh, it's yeah. just like very high level. So could you... Like, could we say that this is like active learning of this linear dynamical system that you try to identify the system, that's your goal, yes. and you're going to interact with the system for a while. For this, you can use any feedback controller yes. or whatever um, to gain information. Uh, but at the end of so many observations, uh, then you have to output some matrices and then you're going to be judged based on how where well, they're estimating three ones. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes. Right. So you can use bo uh, both active and uh, you know like white noise, which is just exploration. Sorry, exploration equally along all directions. But yeah, this this is not so important that I have specifically the expectation with respect to all the randomness. I could also have without any expectation. Let's let's say hard uh, uh, exploration limits. So, okay, let me, let me now define what sample complexity is for this work. So we assume we have a system class of a class of unknown systems, and we assume realizability that the true system lies within this class. And given this assumption, then we can define the sample complexity of learning the class CL as follows. Given an accuracy parameter and a confidence delta, then the sample complexity is the minimum number of samples such so that under some algorithm, system identification algorithm, I have very good estimation performance with high probability. And then we want the number of samples, uh, and, and sorry, and, and zero here is the sample complexity, will of, which will of course depend on the accuracy and the confidence. And also it will depend on the size of the system, which with, by size here, I mean the state dimension, the number of states. And here we uh, define the complexity of class. So we want this guarantee to hold uniformly across every possible uh, instance in this class. So by that, I mean that our algorithms should work for, for every possible unknown instance in that class. We could also define a local sample complexity by, of an instance by, instead of taking a big class here, we can take a local neighborhood of the specific instance. Here I have only A in the definition for simplicity, 
but we could also have B matrix as well. And notice here that my epsilon delta guarantees are with respect to the model. Sometimes, uh, at least like packet learning, you know, we might have some guarantees for the prediction error of the model. So we might want to qualify the prediction performance given some estimate in A and B. We don't do that here. We want guarantees for the model error. And this is useful in control because, you know, some, by, by having a guarantee on the model error, we can argue later about robustness, for example. So in many cases, we prefer this type of guarantees over the prediction error. Uh, if, there are no more, if there are no questions on this, I can proceed. Uh, please let me know if this is clear. Okay. So now let's define what is an easy class of systems. Uh, inspired, of course, by the pack learning community and the co computational learning community, uh, we define a class as easy if we have polynomial complexity with respect to the confidence, the logarithm of the confidence delta, with respect to the accuracy epsilon, and with respect to the system dimension. Yeah. And we will define these classes as easy to learn. So a fundamental question we're trying to answer here is whether linear systems are poly learnable in the sense that, okay, linear systems have structure, have a very nice structure and in general simple to understand. Does this mean that we will get poly learnability or not? Let's see what, what prior work uh, did. So of course we have the asymptotic approach where we can have a uh, low large number type of results or central limit theorem type of results. In these results, you know, we have guarantees like the following that the estimate converges almost surely to A. We could also have a low of iterated logarithm type of result. Or we might have a, a, a CLT type of result. Uh, but these results, uh, of course, are asymptotic and they do not necessarily capture all finite sample behaviors. And also, in many cases, uh, many factors or that, you know, many parameters of the system are hidden under the big O notation. So it's not clear how to use those tools in order to answer the previous question. Uh, recently, there have been many works uh, related to the finite sample complexity of linear systems, and in particular, many useful results for system identification. Uh, I will focus on one of those, which is like the result by Simkovitz and others. So under the isotropic noise assumption that, you know, our noise excites all possible directions, then under the least squares algorithm and white noise inputs, the least squares algorithm uh, just minimizes the prediction error. You know? uh, then we can get the following guarantees. With high probability, the model error is small. If the sample complexity is, is has a polynomial part here, that depends polynomially on the uh, accuracy, the logarithm of the confidence, the state dimension, and we have also a log term. This can be removed easily. It doesn't cause us any problems. Uh, but we also have an excitation part here. And in the case of isotropic noise, we can show that this excitation part is small. So in the end, we can get poly learnable bounds. So, but, so is every linear system poly learnable? Let's consider the following example. Let's uh, assume that we have actuation noise here. So the noise and the input have the same matrix here. Then if we simulate the system over several Monte Carlo simulations, we can see that it seems that the sample complexity increases uh, non-polynomial with the dimension n. And in fact, not only that, it seems to increase exponentially. And we test that for several values of epsilon. So the question is the following. It seems that some non-polynomial uh, system exists in the sense that they're not poly -learned. And in fact, it seems that not only that, some classes of systems might be exponentially hard with a dimension n. So what the question is, what, what, what is missing from prior work? What didn't we capture with the prior results? And to bring back the question, are all linear, linear systems well learnable? And if not, do really exponentially hard systems exist? And then another question is, OK, if exponentially hard systems exist, when can we guarantee that the system will be poly learnable? Uh, please let me know if you have any questions here before I move to uh, a result. result. I do have a quick question. Yeah, um, yeah. But the, these questions are interesting, but you can also ask, like, can it go worse than the exponential in the dimension? 
Are you gonna talk about that? Yeah, 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 this yeah, this is what I will talk about. Yeah. Okay, because I'm like, that, that sounds like a lower bound question, but there is the corresponding upper bound question as well, whether it can- Yeah, I will present both lower and upper bounds. Good. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So let's now pre present the sample complexity bounds. And before doing that, I will start from the prior work. Of course, I somehow spoiled why we might uh, not get polynomial uh, bounds. And of, I, 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 I hide it here, the excitation part. And in the case of isotropic noise, that is the case in prior work, this is a very strong assumption in the sense that immediately it gives very good excitation. So we can have very small component here. So we get polylearnability immediately. But let's look what this uh, gamma k is here. This is a least singular value of a matrix called the controllability gramian. And this matrix captures how, ex how excitable is a state in all possible directions. Or in terms of control theory, it, ca it captures how controllable the system is. But let's do a brief review of control theory. So what is controllability? First of all, let's define the controllability matrix, which is the mapping from all the inputs and noises to the state. So it's a linear map. And this actually matrix captures uh, all the directions where the state can lie in, all the possible directions where I can excite the state. And if we take uh, the square uh, of this matrix, then we obtain the controllability gramian. And in this sense, this controllability gramian captures the excitability of the state or the state magnitude. And it has this following, this uh, nice recursive expression. And from this point of view, the minimum singular value of the controllability gramian captures the direction, which is the most difficult to excite or control. So the previous bound makes sense. And a very fundamental result or in control theory is that a system is called controllable if and only if this matrix has full rank n in, in the sense that we can excite the state in all possible directions. And this is equivalent to having the minimum singular value of this controllability Gramian positive. And, and from, this, from this point of, point view, of view, you can think you can about controllability as uh, excitability of the system or like exploration, the possibility of exploring every possible state. Quick question. Yeah. What is the quantification over k here? OK, k, I, I for simplicity, didn't uh, uh, talk about it. But it can be any value less or equal than n, where n is the state dimension. In the bound here, uh, on purpose, I didn't include it. We could choose even a larger block, a larger index, k. But we will have also a penalty, if we choose a k that's larger than n, we will have a penalty here based on k. But this is not very important for this discussion. OK. So going back to the bound, if we uh, unroll what this uh, controllability gramian is, under this isotropic noise, immediately we can lower bound this matrix by the identity. So immediately we get polynomial bounds. And also we can see that we could uh, directly generalize this idea by using this matrix here instead of only the noise. So in immediate generalization, if we consider the following condition, but this has a name. We can call those systems directly excited system. And the intuition behind the name is that in this type of conditions, uh, every state of the system is directly excited by a noise or input. So in this particular example, where this condition is satisfied, the first state here is excited by the input, while the second state will be excited by the noise. And a special case of this type of systems is the case of isotropic noise. Or another special case is fully actuated systems. Fully actuated systems in control means that every state is directly controlled by an input. Uh, notice here that I have uh, included a new constant, which is not important as long as it is bounded away from zero. Uh, and in general, all of those systems are very easy to excite and control. So we should expect also learning to be easy. And in fact, uh, the first result states exactly that, that the class of directly excited systems under white noise inputs and the least square algorithm is poorly learnable. And the takeaway here is that these systems are very easy to excite or control, so they are very easy to learn. Again, this result was more or less known based on prior work. Uh, 
but there is a problem here. This type of condition has a structural assumption about our system. It requires the rank, the combined rank of B and H to be equal to N. In other words, we want the number of inputs and noises, for example, to be larger than the number of states. This is a structural uh, assumption that might not always hold. The question is now, what happens what if we remove this? Remove... Sorry, do you have any questions? Yeah, I mean, uh, it is more like a comment. Uh, yeah. Just for everyone who is who has an ARA background, they might find it unusual that you're calling the number of state dimensions or components of the state vector the states. Uh, yeah, but so, like you ask for feedback for ARA theory, this would be like totally weird or ARA people. Oh, sorry, what is weird? Yeah. Um, that the state components, you call them the individual states. Because if you have, you know, like an MDP, then states are just states, like the, whole, the, the different values the whole vector can take. That's a state. <laughs> I know that like this, this terminology is commonplace in control. It is you, just that people might be a little bit surprised coming from RL. Uh, when you're like, this is like a side comment. It's absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean the, the term number of states? You mean this term? Here? Yeah, number like ah, see, the see, number see. of that would be yeah, the yeah, number yeah. of state components right. or like the dimension of the vector. You're, you're right. yeah, and yeah. when you, it, it is just, I don't even know, like, yeah, I guess it takes some time to get used to this terminology. Yeah, and yeah. once you, you get used to it, <laughs> then it's like very addictive too, because it's like a shorthand, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, I realize that now because in control we use it all the time. You know, like the number of states is like the. No, it's it's cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I I didn't even want to interact. Well, I was not sure, but no, like it might be worth it because a lot of people here have other background, and for them this may sound unfamiliar. But like, yeah, yeah like this is totally like standard thing in control, right? Yeah. So by state, yeah, it's a state dimension, let's say. So my X is a continuous state space. So it's an infinite state space, but it lies in a subset, let's say, of R to the N. Yeah. So it's a multidimensional state. So the yeah. dimension is N. It's not exactly the, yeah, I mean, in, in the RL, you might have, let's say, the input, the state uh, size, which is a bit different. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah, we have an infinite state space here. Thank you for uh, this point. So the question here is what if we don't have this rank condition? And we remove this structural assumption. What if, for example, we have uh, a rank deficiency in the noise? In this case, we can still uh, do learning. We can still identify the system if we have indirect excitation. In indirect excitation, the systems, the states are eventually excited, but indirectly, and we need to unroll the state in order to have excitation, in the sense that, for example, in this situation, the first state is indirectly excited. And in fact, it is excited by the input, but within a delay, we need to unroll uh, the state equation once in order for the input to appear in the first state. And then in terms of rank conditions, we would express this as the following, that the rank of B8 and a times BH is equal to N, which means that we unroll once in order for the input to reach the first state. And if we repeat this idea to another example, here notice that uh, the first state is indirectly excited, but with a delay of two. We need to unroll the state equation two times. And we have a delay of two here in order to get excitation. And in terms of a run condition, this can be expressed as follows. And notice here that since we enroll two times, we have this a to the square here. And again, if we generalize this idea, we actually reach the controllability condition. So we can define indirectly excited systems as the class of controllable systems, where these run conditions will, will be satisfied for some k larger than one. And again, if you recall, uh, okay, first of all, this is a relaxation of the previous condition that we have for directly excited system. And if you can recall, this is exactly the controllability matrix that we defined before. So from this point of view, uh, controllability here is actually excitability, the ability to even indirectly excite the system. Now, this is a run condition. And even if it's satisfied, uh, the matrices here might be ill-posed numerically. 
So even if we have this condition, we might still not get learnability. And actually, we can prove trivially that the class of all indirectly excited systems has infinite sample complexity. Uh, and the reason is the following. Because we, cannot, we only have a rank constraint, we can still have some ill-posed Ill, Ill systems which are ill numerically, when they are arbitrarily closed to uncontrollability. For example, in the following system, uh, notice that the first state is excited via beta from the second state. But then if this beta is allowed to be arbitrarily small, although the system remains, to, re remains the controllability, uh, sorry, uh, maintains the controllability property, the excitation becomes smaller and smaller. So in the end, it's impossible to excite the first state and it's impossible to learn alpha. So we have to somehow impose extra assumptions to exclude such trivial systems from the discussion. We need to somehow bound the system away from our controllability. For this reason, we consider the following more strict version. Instead of requiring uh, the system to be controllable, we also require it to be controllable along every perturbation around this system for all possible perturbations which are bounded by a constant mu. Uh, of course, we should expect uh, the sample complexity to also depend on this mu parameter here. But for now, let's assume that this is a constant. So going back to the previous example, if we impose this robust controllability condition, then immediately we get rid of those trivial situations. If the system is mu robustly controllable, then immediately this beta will be bounded away from zero. So let's see now what happens with the sample complexity. Unfortunately, even in this case of robustly controllable systems, uh, although we don't have infinite sample complexity, we might still have large sample complexity. And in fact, we might have complexity that is exponential with dimension. So by, using, by proving some lower bounds, we can show that for any algorithm, we can learn uh, the system to a, an accuracy epsilon with high probability only if the number of samples is exponential with a dimension. And the intuition behind this result is that uh, we can consider, for example, uh, long chains of states. By chain, I mean here that every state is indirectly excited by the previous state. And in this particular example, notice here that as we move up the state, this row is less than one. And every time I move up the state, it decreases the excitation signal that I have. So as I move, let's say, from the first state here, from the last state upwards, then the excitation signal becomes smaller and smaller multiplied by this row. So in the end, for example, the expected value of the second state will decay exponentially fast here. And the intuition is that such systems which have long chains are in general hard to excite or hard to control. Let's see more specifically what is the construction for this uh, example. Uh, so the proof be is, before yeah. that, could I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. So, so here in that statement of the theorem, so mu was a variable, but how does how does this bound on n depend on mu? Or did I miss something? Yeah, I will show later how uh, some upper bounds depend on mu. But uh, if you can see more details in the paper, but for mu, we selected uh, mu to be, let's say, upper bounded by a polynomial function of n, the, sorry, the inverse of oh. mu. The technical details are that it, it's bounded by, let's say, mu inverse is bounded by n. And the reason uh, that we chose such a bound is that natural systems like the integrator, for example, mm -hmm. have exactly this uh, mu constant. So if you consider the integrator is like, uh, like of, of this type, you know, where in the diagonal mm -hmm. you have ones. So in this type of systems, mu is one over n, let's say. Right. Uh, I guess that was going to be my next question is like, how natural is this assumption on, yeah. on local perturbations? I guess you can save that for later. Yeah. So again, like we, so you, you mean like the M robust controllability, new robust controllability? Yeah. 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 So this is, uh, I mean, without this assumption, you cannot have sample complexity bounds which are finite, right? Because as I said before, if you are arbitrarily close to controllability, you can have infinite sample complexity. But then there are many systems which are reasonable, like the integrator, uh, you know, uh, are mu robustly controllable, where mu 
the, the greatest polynomial within. Right. Yeah, yeah. I guess. I guess we, the question is, well, how natural is this assumption, and what are natural values of mu that one can choose, and what are the best attainable results that one can get? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess like looking into the data, so this like, what is the choice of mu for this example are interesting, but maybe too technical for now. Yeah, it's a bit. I mean, this is why I didn't include it in the presentation, but uh, we can discuss a bit. Later. All right. Okay. Yeah. Let's save it for later. Yeah. Thank you. So the proof is based on, based on uh, minimax approach. And we construct two systems which are epsilon away, but they have very similar uh, behavior. And in particular, exactly because the excitation is very small, uh, we can prove that the KL divergence between the, uh, the two distributions under system one and system two will be really small. Here, this is exponentially small. And then here we have a term that depends on the number of samples and the uh, magnitude of the inputs. So technical uh, details aside, by, uh, if, I, if I now neglect the epsilon and the confidence delta, then the systems will be indistinguishable unless the product of the number of samples and the control magnitude is exponentially large here. And notice that this construction here is not only global, but also local around this instance. And let's focus more on this condition here. So we need either the samples or the control uh, inputs to be exponentially large. Now, in the first case, because I assumed, uh, I had this assumption earlier, uh, that the control energy is bounded, the only way we can obtain uh, learning guarantees uh, is if we have an exponential number of, uh, of samples. But an alternative interpretation, if we allowed the input, if we remove this assumption and we allow the inputs to be very large, is that, okay, I can have polylearnability, but uh, I, I need to have very large control inputs. This is an alternative interpretation that we could have. In the first case, we have uh, statistical difficulty. In the second case, we have control difficulty. I think this, is, uh, this condition is like uh, an uncertainty principle. We cannot have both good, you know. And I think it's interesting uh, for future uh, exploration. So, uh, having uh, So what we have seen so far is that directly excited systems are easy to learn. Uh, indirectly excited systems with long chains of indirect excitation are hard. So the question is, what lies in between? What about, for example, systems which have small chains or, you know, uh, something in between? And how can we quantify this notion of chain length? This is exactly what the controllability index does. So remember that uh, we defined the controllability condition as this, that's this rank condition for some k larger than one. And recall that indirectly excited systems are excited indirectly by enrolling the state k times, but the controllability index is the minimum such index that we can achieve, well, that we can achieve this condition. And it's the minimum times we need to enroll the state in order to satisfy this rank condition. And by Cayley Hamilton, we can show actually that if the system is controllable, then this controllability index cannot be larger than n. Uh, let's present some examples to clarify this notion. Uh, directly excited systems have controllability index one because we have direct excitation. Now, if we have, for example, a system with two chains, let's say two subsystems, uh, this subsystem has length one because the final state is directly excited by the last input. And this subsystem here has length two because the first state has, needs two steps in order to get reached by an input. So in this case, the controllability index will be two. What I want you to remember from all this definition is that controllability index is the depth of indirect excitation. And, and because of this, it captures in some sense the structural difficulty of control or excitation. Intuitively, this is what you need to remember. And for this reason, we should expect uh, learning to depend on this uh, index. And for example, learning should become easier and this index becomes smaller. And this is exactly what we prove in the following upper bounds. We prove that if we have new robust controllability, and if we also have a controllability index that is bounded up from above by this kappa, then under the least squares algorithm and white noise inputs, 
uh, we can achieve good learning performance with higher probability if the sample complexity is polynomial with the confidence, the accuracy, and the state, but at most exponential with the controllability index, kappa. And what this shows actually is that, for example, if this controllability index is small, if it's O of 1, then we have small chains of systems and we can recover uh, polylearnability. We can also recover the case of directly excited system as a special case. And also, although this might not be quantitative sharp, it's qualitatively sharp in the sense that based on the previous lower bounds, we can show that we cannot avoid this exponential dependence in general. So this is tied qualitatively. And let's summarize what is the picture here. So prior, in prior work, we knew that directly excited systems are easy to learn, but by using uh, our theorems, we can extend the systems which are polylearnable to the case where the controllability index is small. In the case of indirect uh, excitation with large controllability indexes, uh, unfortunately, learning is exponentially hard in general with the dimension. Note that there might still be systems that are locally polylearnable if we have large controllability index, but without any additional assumptions, we cannot necessarily uh, say much. So yeah, you, we might, there might be some subclasses you know, that are easier. But in the general case, this is not the case. So let's present very briefly the sketch of proof. Again, going back to the result of Simkovic, we need to lower bound this Gramian here. All the other parts are polynomial. And this is what we do in the following uh, theorem. We prove that if we have the new robust controllability condition, then the minimum singular value of the controllability Gramian degrades at most exponentially with the controllability index. And notice here that I finally reveal the dependence on the new parameter. And also, yeah, mu is the robustness parameter. So the more robust I am, the better, of course, for the degradation. And also we have this M here, which is, if you remember, the bound on the state space parameters. So for example, the bound on A, the more we allow A to be large, the worse this bound becomes. And this, we use this result for sample complexity, but this could be of independent interest uh, in control theory. Uh, I might not have the time to go through the proof, but it follows from this, of course, assumption of robust controllability and the properties of uh, the controllability matrix, like the cyclic structure. And then we use uh, the composition of the state space using the so-called Heisenberg canonical form. You can check more details in the paper or later we have more time. I can show some of the steps. So let's see now what's going on with some numerical examples. If we analyze, for example, the Jordan block with eigenvalue lambda, where we only excite the last state, then we see that uh, the sample complexity is also exponential with the dimension n for var various values of lambda less than one. But as we reach lambda equals to one, then it seems that there is a phase transition and the complexity becomes polynomial. Uh, un unfortunately, we don't have a formal proof, but this is a conjecture here that it would be an interesting future work direction. Uh, now, uh, let's play around with the controllability index. Consider again the same system. And now we experiment with different values of B. Uh, in the first case, we only excite the last state. Uh, in the second case, we excite uh, two of those components of the state. And in the final uh, case, we excite half of the states. So we can see that as we transition from linear controllability index to small controllability index, there is a phase transition from exponential sample complexity uh, to polynomial sample complexity, which verifies uh, the results that we have. So let me now summarize what I've talked about so far. Again, uh, we had the prior work for uh, uh, directly excited systems. And we painted a more diverse picture by extending uh, those results to systems with small, small controllability index. And uh, what we should remember here is that systems which are easy to control or excite structurally are also easy to learn. 
And then, in general, in the indirect excited systems might be difficult to learn, especially if the degree of uh, indirect excitation is large, which is captured through the controllability index. So, you will have for sure many questions now in the following sense. Uh, okay, you talked about learning a model, but why should I care uh, about this model process? if I only want to do control or do some reinforcement learning. So that's an open question for me. Uh, the question is, OK, maybe we don't need to identify everything in order to control. For example, in the previous, uh, let's say, corner case that gave us exponential uh, sample complexity, why should we care to learn alpha? Maybe we could just ignore those modes that are uh, very hard to excite and just uh, apply a, control a simple controller for some of uh, the modes of the system. So in many situations, maybe we can do that. For example, this system is very well behaved. It's very stable. Uh, but in, in, in some other situations, it might not be the case. So it's not clear to me how to answer this question. Because, for example, in, in the top of the chain, we might have an unstable state, for example. What I want to say here is that, yes, in some cases, we might not need to identify the whole model. But it's not straightforward when we can do that and, and when not. A similar question, open question, would be to do, let's say, agnostic learning and assume that we don't have realizability. And we want to maybe learn uh, f f through a simpler class of models, for example, lower dimension models. Maybe for control, that's enough. And we don't need to learn the, the whole model. And an open question is, OK, if we do this agnostic, agnostic type of uh, and we remove this realizability assumption, we'll, we'll still have exponential sampling complexity. And again, when can we do that for control purposes? Another open problem is the case of LQR control, where here we have a quadratic uh, state and quadratic uh, input penal a penalty that we want to minimize. An open question here is, can we do the LQR either online or offline uh, using a polynomial number of samples with respect to the dimension. And although there have been some prior works, of course, this has been extensively studied, uh, sometimes those bounds depend exponentially on the dimension, or they might depend on some control theoretic parameters, which again can be uh, exponential with dimension. So it's not clear to me uh, when this is possible and when it's not. Also, it's not clear to me if you know changing those costs will affect sample complexity. Let's and finally, can I, can I uh, yeah, yeah. very quickly ask a question on this? Yes. Are you familiar with the paper of Xinyi Chen and Elad Hazan, Black Box Control of Linear Dynamic Systems? I think that they have an exponential lower bound. It's for the regret. Okay. Uh, okay. Exponential in the dimension. Yeah. I think that I think one that's is one. for uh, adversarial noise. It's or? for at your I, I know so uh, the original one was for adversarial uh -huh. noise and then they kept working on it and then I I think that the latest version is just for the okay, standard. I'm not sure if I just check the latest version, but that would yeah. actually be very interesting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, if we have Jordan blocks, uh, it's an open question to indeed verify whether. We, you know, we have exponential uh, complexity, we have lambda less than one, and uh, if we have polynomial complexity, if, you know, this lambda is equal to one. Okay, that concludes uh, my talk. Thank you very much. And I would like to listen to any comments you have, feedback, questions. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, this was really wonderful, well explained. Very nice work as well. So I'm just I'm just really wondering about well, getting back to my earlier comments mm -hmm. regarding the upper and lower bands because it seems to me that there is still a gap between those, right? Because in one you treat mu as a constant, and in the other one mu is being tuned as a function of n, right? So so if you look at the lower band, for example, which is exponential yes. in n. There you could have chosen like mu even smaller and get and got a bound that is like even worse than exponential, no? So yeah, so the assumption we have in the paper is that the mu degrades at most polynomially with n. Okay. Again, Let me rephrase that as a question of what Gerg is asking. All what right. if you keep mu constant? 
<laughs> That's a very nice question, actually. Uh, the counter examples we have have a new inverse that is linear with n. So in the sense that new is one over n, so it degrades with n. Now, this assumption is very reasonable because, for example, the integrator has exactly this property. And, and so I think it's a reasonable assumption. But it's very interesting to see if we, for example, have constant mu. And I don't know how to answer this question. It will be interesting, actually. If, if we keep constant mu, can we still find uh, a counterexample? So from this point of view, there is some gap in my bounds. Because if I have constant mu here, uh, where is it? If I have constant mu here, I cannot necessarily remove this exponential uh, complexity. So, it, I mean, m maybe we cannot, but in my lower bounds, I had to use mu, which is uh, 1 over n, let's see. Maybe that answers the question. Uh, yeah, part of it. Uh, I guess, like, still regarding the lower bound, so you're saying that you cannot pick a polynomial 1 over mu that is going to result in sample complexity that is super exponential? Oh, yeah, I mean, it, uh, ah, 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 I see, I see. So if you want super exponential, you, had to, you have to use mu that, is, that degrades worse than polynomial. Oh, I see. You would okay. have to pick mu that, uh, let's say, degrades exponentially or super exponentially. OK, OK. Like, based uh, on this result, you know, it's, so yeah, here, I don't know if you can see it. I mm -hmm, hide it mm -hmm, in the purple. Yeah. So you have mu here. So mm -hmm. if mu is like uh, polynomial, then superimposed by, I mean, if, if, oh, yeah, yeah, in the end, only, ca only kappa will yeah, yeah, Of course, of course, yeah. All right, yeah, that's great. Yes, very good. So there are some questions in the chat. I don't know. If anybody check those. So so Piotr, maybe maybe you can ask you a question. Let's go ahead and ask right. yourself. S sorry. Um, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if this is a, a very naive question, but um, I was wondering, um, you measure the discrepancy as essentially a, a vector norm applied to the uh, difference between the uh, ground truth and the um, uh, estimate. But um, I mean, you have a very rich class of invariants that you can quotient out of uh, your approximate system and your true system by just looking at the, the spectra or the characteristic polynomial. And I was wondering, and this is this is where my kind of naivete shows, uh, if that is not just like, like the, the particular case you considered, or if it's just technically uh, infeasible to 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 kind of uh, try to characterize that. You mean instead of characterizing the norm error here, for example, to have uh, the eigenvalues or some other uh, objective? Yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, I have to think about it. I, uh, I'm not sure if, I, I mean, I, I don't have an answer immediately if uh, things would change. Uh, I mean, just something maybe, that was, th yeah. sorry, something that I was thinking, you can have um, minute perturbations to, uh, uh like systems with repeated eigenvalues that are going to affect the uh the structure of the jordan blocks and everything uh and they're going to be like essentially epsilon close uh within you know any any vector norm uh but maybe this is also a little bit pedantic but like you know the the underlying eigenvalues are going to change and uh, the structure is going to change and then the length of a chain is going to change um potentially considerably um and then and so yeah that's uh, sort of why I'm, I'm, I was asking this. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm not sure if I, 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 I got exactly what you meant with the last argument. So you mean if we include, for example, perturbations so that the structure can also change? Um, like drastic perturbations that can also, I mean, like drastic, but uh, perturbations that can change the structure? Uh, well, the, the perturbations for, for systems with uh, repeated eigenvalues uh, yes. will change um, yeah. the, the, the resulting, uh, you know, Jordan form. Uh, and so, so, yeah. So we consider all perturbations within epsilon. So in this sense, uh, in the end, for example, in this construction, for example, uh, mm -hmm. 
we consider all possible perturbations, but it turns out that the difficult, let's say, perturbation is only with respect to this, um, you know, element, which doesn't necessarily change the structure, but is included within this ball that we consider. Mm -hmm. So maybe if the perturbation changes the structure drastically, and it's still within epsilon, maybe mm -hmm. then we wouldn't have the same problem. I'm, I'm not sure. But since we took the whole ball, uh, this subcase, for example, is included there. So it's enough yeah. to destroy our sample complexity guarantees. As I mentioned here, this is a, a local uh, type of argument in the sense that this lies in an epsilon neighborhood of the system. But yeah. maybe if, if your perturbation changes the structure, maybe you, know, you wouldn't have such an indistinguishable uh, uh, condition here. You might have better KL divergence. I don't know if this answers. Um. Uh, I mean, I, I still need to digest, uh, but definitely piques my interest. So I'll uh, just read it and uh, maybe shoot you an email. Sure, Thank sure. You. Thank you. All right. So along the same lines, does this does this error in operator norm have some particular motivation? Uh, so one of the motivation is that we might uh, argue later about robustness. But yeah, so I like, guess like, this norm important for robustness. I don't know. I'm just uh, yeah. I mean, to see uh, if you side. check the papers by Sarah Dean and uh, Nikolai Matni and those people, uh, you know they have used such use funds to establish robust, robust controllers, for example. If you have finite dimensional everything, all norms are equivalent. So it's like once you set it on one norm, you set it on all on the norms. If you don't care about the constants, if you start to care about the particle constants, then for sure. Uh, Sorry, can impression. you repeat? Uh, can you please repeat? It's just like a comment that yeah, yeah. like all norms are equivalent in these spaces. So if you don't care about the constants that appear in a bound, which can yeah. be dependent, dependent constants, but poly, poly, uh, or I don't like it depends on how you convert the norms. But like for reasonable norms, it's gonna be poly. Uh, then, yes, then yes. it doesn't matter which norm you use. I mean, yeah, for this type of question. distinction that we have here, with this, what's only distinguished between polynomials with a dimension or exponential with a dimension, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, so Kamir, you also had a question. Kamir, if you're still here, maybe you can ask. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, I'm not sure how it's related because in your setting, sometimes you had B, sometimes you didn't. So, what is the relationship between this new robustly controllable setting and this strongly stabilizable setting? Is there any substance to present the relationship in here? So, I'm not sure which definition of strongly stabilizable you mean, uh, but uh, it, I mean it might be related. If strongly stabilizable means that for every uh, perturbation you have stabilizability. No, this means that uh, for I guess in your setting means like this A and B matrix for this system based on A and B there's a transformation state. Then in that setting the system the the spectral norm of your system the closed controller is at less than one basically. Yeah, yeah, but uh, by strongly you mean like the same condition that for every perturbation. No, no, uh, I'm, I'm not. I don't know how they are related. That uh, question was how they are related. Yeah, because I, I mean, I'm not sure what is the definition of uh, because, you know, many times you have many different terms for some definitions. I'm not sure if by strongly stabilizable, you mean like uh, the same condition. I mean, I mean, if it's you could define this for stabilizability, of course, like we, using the following uh, procedure, define that the system is robustly stabilizable if it's, you know, stabilizable for every perturbation. I mean, you could, yes, you could extend this definition for stabilizability as well, I guess. Oh, let so me share paper. Do you, do you remember the definition of kappa gamma strongly stabilizable? Come here. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me share. Okay. Ah, the kappa. Okay. Oh, the, you mean the strongly? St oh, okay, I see. I see. So yeah. you mean the conditions, for example, in some LQR papers that you use the strongly stable kappa gamma strongly stable? Yeah, you should. Okay, so I have I have a concern about this uh, consumption because in this case, I think you need a similarity transformation. And yeah. you need to bound the condition number of the similarity transformation. Yeah, you do. Which might be really large. So yeah. in our paper, we, go, we went around that by, by using the sure form of uh, state space. So in this situation, you need to find the transformation, the similarity transformation. Let's say that will diagonalize your system, or you know, you will put it in the Jordan form. But yeah. this might be very imposed numerically, and you might have uh, exponential dependence on the dimension just because of the similarity transformation. We go yeah. around that by using the sure form 
uh, which is like a unitary transformation. Not sure if would, would uh, not sure if the same approach would work for control, but at least for identification, you, we managed to avoid this uh, type of assumption. I see. So it's not okay. They, these sets might intersect, but it's not one of them does not contain or include the other. Yeah, it's not exactly the same. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's not. It's not because in the, in the in the other case, I mean, in this case, you can have arbitrarily bad condition number if you want to do the Jordan form. So it, like. Yeah, it, it's it's not it's not it's not very related. Basically. Yeah, you, you, you might notice results like for for this the strongest stabilizable setting. If you don't have a stabilizable controller, you there's a learning exponential upper bound. When you have access to a stabilizable controller, you have you have polynomial uh, upper bound and learning parameters. For the, for that setting, you have these bounds. But I'm not sure how that one translates here. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would be interested to check that in more detail, to be honest. I mean, if you have a, a specific paper to check, I would be interested in seeing that in more detail. Sure, there's but, background noise. There's a plane flying here. Sorry about that. I'll well, share on the, on, the, on the chat. But, I mean, at, at least the, strong, the kappa gamma strongly stable is different. Now, maybe, yeah, the stabilizable is, might be something else. Right. So there was another question in the chat uh, by Yang Sheng, who was asking if you can extend your results to unstable systems. So uh, yes, I, I, I mean I I haven't uh, done the work to do it, but it should be easy, relatively, to repeat the same conclusions at least for the lower bounds, because these systems are a subset, a subset of unstable systems are a subset of all possible systems, right? At, so we could just repeat the same construction in, in that case as well. Uh, now, the difference will be in the upper bounds because the benefit of unstable systems, uh, so maybe we can improve you know, the performance here. Because sometimes if you have unstable systems, the excitation of the unstable substate is faster. So it would be actually an interesting thing to check whether sometimes you can actually avoid maybe uh, exponential complexity if you have some unstable component you know for example maybe if in the middle of this chain you add an unstable component you know maybe somehow it improves excitation but this again would have to do with upper bounds for lower bounds we can follow the same construction and still have the same pessimistic result Right, yes, yes. Yeah. All right, so, so, so Pavan, you have raised your hand. Are you going to ask your question? Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, there is a underlying uh, assumption, uh, not assumption, but a generic fact that uh, all state space models are non unique. So, we could have two models that don't look similar to each other in the structure. Uh, but could still give the same dynamics. Uh, so in, in the work, it appears that there's a lot of emphasis on the structure. So is it a, a prerequisite that we know the structure of the system? So uh, first of all, uh, in the fully observed case, you have unique uh, state space parameterization. Because at least, OK, you have unique if you have a full excitation. If uh, uh, I mean, sorry, I confused you. <laughs> what I mean is like the parameterization is unique and then you can learn this unique parameterization if you have full excitation because you have fully observed systems. Uh, the problem of non-unique parameterization is you have partial observability. So as long as this will be positive, then you, know, you can also recover this parameterization. Now we don't assume uh, anything about the structure. You could treat this as a black box. Uh, identification in the sense that the only assumptions we have is uh, this. And we have some upper bounds on the state space parameters. Okay, we have also this assumption, but this doesn't necessarily reveal the structure. Does this cover your answer? Uh, it's close. 
Please let me know. All right, so maybe it's time to go off the record. Uh, Chava can ask you the last year questions that I see he's already ready for. Sure, yeah, we can go off the record. <clears throat> yeah, I guess I can just edit out whatever comes up next. The recording is going to be stopped when uh, and just a quick when question. Alex can do it. Uh, what happens if you relax the white noise assumption? So, ah, you mean for the noise like here? Yes, yeah. I mean, I, I expect the bounce to also work for a Martin Gale type of noise. I, I cannot, I mean, this is just, I mean, my intuition. I, I don't know yet, I don't know immediately how to tell you how to, to solve it, but I think you could also have some structure like that. As long as you know you have a new randomness. So as long as, uh, you know, for example, WG, given the past information, for example, uh, has sufficient randomness. Which is covariance matrix. Yeah, for example, yes. And I guess there will be some tail condition as well. So heavy tail noise may not be. Yes, yes, I think so. Or I, I don't know, like, things, it's... things can work in a weird way for identifiability. Uh, yeah, there but is one there algorithm. Is but there is there is a cut here. So there, there, there used to be a subject of interest in control where you might have the so-called colored noise, where, you know, this W has an inner uh, parameterization of which is... Uh, so maybe W could be, for example, a dynamical system itself. And it's the so-called stochastic part of the system. And in this case, you know, WK is a dynamical system itself, and it's more close to the partial observable case. So this might complicate a bit things in the sense, that, for example, that we, you, you will not have a unique noise representation, for example. But I expect learning of A and B to be, I expect learning of A and B to be okay, to be fine, even in this case. So there was a, a old algorithm for subspace identification called N4SID. Uh, that yeah, yeah. works very well with white noise, but you introduce colored noise, the performance just goes off. But there are other algorithms that cover uh, color noise as well, like MOSP. Yeah, I mean, I th yeah, I think, yeah, if, if you don't have the IID, you have to use some subspace. And yeah, I'm not sure which is the best to use, but statistically, at least, they should work. If, at, I mean, if you analyze the, the colored noise here, if all the color noise is like, say, in linear combination of Gaussian IID, noise. So if what generates this noise is a filtered IID noise, let's say, then it should work statistically, both of the methods. I mean, okay, I'm not sure about the practical uh, aspects. So I'm not sure if they could work well in practice or not. But you can adapt the subspace methods to somehow capture the stochastic part. Thank you. Yeah, um, different aspect of noise. So uh, the way you're learning is that you're injecting white noise. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's, one that's one option. But I'm mean, like that. That's how the upper bounds are proven for now. Exactly. Uh, which is mildly disappointing for someone who is expecting some cleverness. Uh, in the way you learn some system, dynamic system. Uh, so the question is whether there is much to be gained. Maybe the situation is to be more complicated for active learning, really active. Like this is just like passively, like sliding yeah. the system and not caring about the specifics. No feedback is used for redesigning how you're exciting the system. So is it just like constant factors that you can perhaps gain for this type of systems that you're studying? Uh, if you are, if you try to be more clever uh, about the way you're generating the inputs, uh, or like what what are your thoughts about like yeah. when would be the first case when you have to do something more clever than 
just why nowadays? So in this work, we focus like on the this, this uh, like distinguishing between easy and hard problems. Sure. So I didn't focus on the active learning part, but I think it's very important to consider that in general. And actually, there is a work that I cited here, uh, this one, mm -hmm. uh, where they studied exactly this type of problems. I think you can have some improvements, and in general, uh, the objective is to mean uh, maximize this. Uh, if you can somehow inject clever noise, uh, clever inputs to maximize this. Uh, in a way, your lower bonds are kind of like removing that possibility to some degree, although there is some gap between the lower and upper bonds, so maybe yeah. that's where. So notice that in my assumptions, I had this bounded control energy. So I had this assumption. Okay. Right, right. So even if you do use an active or a, or a passive learning, you will still have bad uh, identif identification performance. Of course, if you relax that, as I showed anyway, you can improve performance. So we had this yeah, uncertainty principle, let's say. Yeah. Uh, here, you can improve. So I expect, I expect um, if you don't have any limitation on the inputs, of course, you can have efficient learning. But I expect also, I expect the active learning to remove, to improve the constant. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it could improve, let's say, the dependence on epsilon or the confidence delta. But I think it should improve the dependence, maybe on some logarithmic factors. Uh, yeah, but I, I have to go again through those papers. To, to give you an honest answer. Well, I, I would expect to improve some logarithmic factors or some constants. Mm -hmm. But I have, I, I mean, yeah, I need to go again in detail to give you a more complete answer. Yeah. Or at least, you know, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, or at least, you know, in theory, let's say that, you know, there is a gap that you might if somehow you found a good uh, control uh, low, you might remove some of those factors. But finding it in practice, not I don't know if it's uh, how easy it is or not. But it's something I want to definitely explore right. more. Okay. Another direction for exploration, or maybe not, <laughs> is uh, that these results are stated for learning the matrix A. Mm -hmm. How would matrix B? Like, yeah, is so it absolutely super clear that there is no difficulty there? I said, there is difficulty, right? Like, you don't even know the sign and like, how is it go? I mean, like, as long as you are inputting white noise and you don't have to be clever about the inputs, maybe it's okay. Yes, exactly, exactly. So that's the problem of active learning, I think. It's uh, exactly when you don't know matrix B. Yeah. Uh, at least to my impression, you know. And uh, right. yeah, if you use white noise, then I guess it's very straightforward to recover B because, you know, you excite every B direction in some sense. So it's not like, and you can freely choose the input. So you will not have the same problem that you have with the states where you might not be able to sample from some states because they are very hard to reach them. Okay. Yeah, I would expect that problem to arise more in active learning formulations. Cool. Thank you. Um. I don't know whether we want to return to these questions that you started the whole talk with, whether, the, whether identification is, is actually something we should even engage with. <laughs> yeah, that's... Did you have any further thoughts about that? So, I think we have to impose some more structure in order to answer those questions, honestly, because, okay. as you can see, for example, in this situation, in many cases, we might not need identification of everything. We only care about control. But, okay, in some very extreme situations, it's not clear to me because, you know, in this case, for example, you need to identify alpha to be able to stabilize the system. 
So, yeah, I mean, we need a way to uh, exclude extreme cases like this one. Yeah. So maybe one can abstractly ask the question uh, whether, you know, control, minimizing regret or whatnot, implies that you learned enough about the system or not. It's like an online to batch reduction, we'd call it, or something mm -hmm. like that. But by the time you know how to control, you can somehow, from the way you control, you can extract the information that, okay, maybe the system didn't construct the estimates, but like you could construct some estimates, so there was enough information there, or maybe this is just not true. Uh, no, I think this makes sense as an idea. Uh -huh. You need to have, uh, I mean, yeah, in order to do control, you need uh, some nece uh, necessarily, you need, so in here, for example, you need implicitly the information of alpha in order to control. Otherwise, if you, if you, for example, you don't know the sign of alpha, you will fail with the control. Yeah, I'm thinking about things like that. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the point here, like for this example, at least. And also, I think, as I stated here, but I didn't spend much time to discuss about it. I think also how you select the, re the rewards, let's say, or the costs might influence. So, for example, if you don't care about the whole state space and you want to regulate only a part of that state, then, you know, things might change. Maybe uh, what I need to identify will depend on um, sure. how I choose the costs. Yeah. Exactly.